Um, so for international education, this is, you, you view this as another uh, perspective on how to do human development. Um, and, uh, you know, we've already discussed the de development economist perspectives. Um, we discussed um, the health perspective. Um, so we're going to do the education perspective today and the business perspective on, on um, Friday. Um, so international education, um, well, there's been a lot that's happened. A lot of connections to development. Um, if you think about it for a minute, um, again, the Human Development Index, you remember, three components, the, the so-called dimension indices. Number one, uh, money, related to standard living. Number two, health, as measured by life expectancy. Number three, education. There's two components of education in Human Development Index. Those are the um, average numbers of um, school, um, years achieved and the expected number of school years achieved okay and then um, so this is a really a key component the experts say is doing human development so it is in a sense a very important thing you know of course water filtration or water is really really important of course but a lot of people would say education has a very high ranking in terms of importance because of how fundamental it is you remember we talked about last time the importance of health because health impacts well education it impacts how much money you can get because it affects how productive you are at work well education sort of like health in a certain way because it impacts how much money you can make right it impacts um, your health because you're if you as you become more educated you know how to take care of yourself okay so it's really another fundamental issue to address when it comes to human development Okay, so the way I'm going to start is like I have many times in class on the subject is I sort of start up close um, and, and um, we'll discuss issues up close and we'll do that via two um, YouTube movies that are um, from different parts of the world. Uh, one in Africa, this Cameroon one. So let's, this is, these are short videos. Um, um, let's just watch this one here. This is a classroom in, in Cameroon. This class is never boring. It almost counts 100 children. And the exercise requires the help of an assistant teacher. For many years, large classes like this one were the norm in Cameroon in West Africa. Kids here lacked school books, even the most basic items, such as sponges, to erase their worn out blackboards. For the teacher, business as usual. This blackboard and two notebooks, that's all the student has in her school bag. And the teacher isn't much better off herself. The parents have to pay her directly because the school doesn't have the money to pay her a salary. But the parents' contribution is not reliable pay either. There are some parents who can't pay the 2,000 francs required. For years, Cameroon had to rely on this system and education sector in disrepair. But a large-scale fix has arrived. And it is all about the teachers and the trickle effect of well-spent money. With the help of the Global Partnership for Education and other development partners, Cameroon's government has hired more teachers, creating reliable jobs. Abunan de Dieu is one of the teachers who had to worry for years about his pay. A whole family depending on the voluntary contributions of parents. The father of four now has a contract and receives a regular salary. In the past, you sometimes had to wait four, five or six months before you got a little money, but now it's on a regular basis, each month. It's still very little, but it comes regularly. And while computers and TV sets only exist as student-made models, this school at least has new school books, which the Dieu keeps in a chest like a treasure. Instead of paying teachers, parents can now buy basic school materials for their children. These students now write with pens and paper instead of chalk and blackboards. The reliable pay for the Dieu and his colleagues has created demand for teaching jobs. In fact, the market for teachers has become more competitive and applicants have proven to be more dedicated. 
They now come to class on a regular basis. This is a change. Before they pursued other activities on the side, driving motor taxi or work in bars. Now they have stopped and they come to school. A positive change. And more teachers need smaller classes. The classroom size in this school has been slashed in half. In this reading class, the letter S is spelled S as in sun or spoon. Now it can also be spelled S as in success. Comments, questions, discussion. I mean, it, it gives you a peek into, you know, a different thing than most of us have experienced, Radhika. Where did they get the money again? Well, it was confusing because he said it fast, but I, I, I thought it was a, a coalition. I thought it was in the World Bank, but it was somebody else too. I didn't catch it. Yeah, so but was it on like another short-term loan? I don't know. Yeah, it, I mean, good question because. How long is this going to go on? How sustainable is it? Yeah. Anything else? Anybody notice some things? You, know, you see the, the classroom and the setting. And there's, there's, what, what, what do you think? Did you, you observe some things that were interesting? One thing jumped out at me. I mean, I don't. Anybody? Right near the end there. So, so a uh, culture jumped out. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, right? there. Okay, look at the board. Yeah. Number one, exactly. Amazing. Number two, what else? Yes. Under the role of the father. Ah. Is that what you're talking well, about? Well, the English is another issue yeah. that's surprising. But, but, the, but the, it, under the role of the father, unfortunately, there's nothing over here. I wanted to see what's over yeah. here. You know, the role of mother, for instance. But, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a, I, I think, uh, well, I don't know who wrote it, right? Did the teacher write it? I suspect so, right? Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, the English is, is uh, wow. Okay, so uh, any other comments? Let's go to the next one. So next one is uh, from our old buddy Guatemala. Um, Monica and her family live in the Midwestern highlands of Guatemala. They are members of the Cachical people, one of 21 different Mayan groups in Guatemala. At home, they speak the language of Kachikalka. Monica's mother speaks almost no Spanish. About 60% of Guatemala's population is indigenous and speaks approximately 26 different Mayan languages. But since the 16th century, when Spain colonized Guatemala, Spanish was imposed as the official language and was the sole language taught in schools. Teresa Chumil is a teacher at Monica's elementary school. When I was in school, my teacher only spoke Spanish. She didn't speak Kachika. I came to school with such fear that I would not understand the classes or my teacher. Many of my classmates dropped out because they simply couldn't understand the teacher. My friends and I always speak in Kachika. If I had gone to school, and the teacher and all my friends spoke in Spanish, I would have been sad. UNICEF is committed to bilingual education because we believe that every child has a right to education in their native tongue. Each child needs an opportunity to develop their potential, otherwise we might lose them forever. UNICEF ensures that the littlest students start learning in their native language. Then, gradually, Spanish is introduced. By the end of primary school, the students are fluent in Spanish and ready for the outside world. Without UNICEF's customized teacher training and classroom materials, this would not be possible. I am very happy that my children are learning two languages, Spanish and Kachikal, and they're doing great in school. 
The help that UNICEF has provided has been excellent for our little school. Now that I'm a bilingual teacher, it makes me so happy to see a child when they first understand what I'm saying in Spanish. And understanding the teacher means more than just enjoying <coughs> school. It means keeping kids from dropping out where they are vulnerable to getting caught in a spiral of poverty. I like Kachikawa and Spanish because they allow me to speak well. When I'm big, I want to be a teacher to teach students languages. Um, comments? It's, uh, it is interesting. Oh, oh, oh. Kill that. Kill that. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, this strategy, by the way, isn't, like, unique to Guatemala. I mean, um, this is often used in the United States um, for bilingual education. Um, and uh, you know, it they really raised a lot of the essential issues in that. That I've heard about too when I've been in Guatemala, and that is, is that if you, you just impose Spanish you, from right from day one, you know, kids can't catch up and learn, uh, and they end up dropping out, and it ruins them, or it delays them by multiple years. So the idea is, is you, know, you start in the native language, and then you, like she said, introduce Spanish, and uh, they end up with both. Um, you remember Chino? What Chino say? Who remembers? Why do you want to learn Spanish, Chino? You remember? Hey, buddy. So you can get a job. Yeah. He says, I won't be able to get a job. Oh, that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. He understands that. I mean, because the dominant language in, in these situations that came from, that's sometimes called the colonial language, you know, is, is that's where the money's at, right? And so it's just a reality. I have a question about that. Yeah. So French is the colonial language in West Africa. Mm hmm and they're learning English. Okay, rather than, you know, they're like a step ahead almost. Okay, so, you know, so my experience on this thing, is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's limited, but it's pretty fascinating to talk to people from Europe, for instance, uh, friends from Spain, um, who their second language that children would learn for many years in Spain was French. But it's been switched a lot, at least, and maybe entirely by now, to English. So there's a lot of countries that are doing, you know, the second language education in English. And, you know, what's driving that, of course, is, is money. It's, it's business. But it's more than that. It's, it's science, engineering, technology. It's medicine. It's, it's just like... Yeah, but what I'm saying is in West Africa, that's their third language. Their first language is their regional... Yeah, and then language, French, and then, and then English. English. But, like, in Guatemala, they're just... They're only getting to the Spanish level and not getting to the... Yeah. Full, you know, the more international language of English. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, however, how many um, how much English is taught in Guatemala? I don't. I, I have no idea. Um, in that region, I haven't heard of that. Okay, um, and in Latin America, I mean, these are difficult issues. I, so India has a lot of English education going on. A lot of the schools are in English at all levels. I mean, uh, but, but I know of certain Latin American countries where this is rejected because um, of pride in their own language, okay? So there are, there are cultural issues about the openness and acceptance of learning another language. Um, I mean, uh, but, it, but at the same time, you know, with respect to these languages that aren't getting used, you know, uh, there's data on the web on this, you can look it up, but it's, you know, there's thousands of languages, right? Okay, but, the, but over the last hundred years, we've lost a lot of languages from the world permanently. Um, and uh, that is still happening today. Uh, so some people don't like this, this growing dominance of English because of that. Actually taught Hindi in school, 
so Hindi was imposed as like the nationwide language, even though like a, less than a quarter of the people knew it as their mother tongue. And so like my parents both speak five languages each because they were taught Sanskrit in school, kind of the same way that we learn Latin sometimes, where it's like dead language, but all of your classics are written in Latin. So they learned Sanskrit in that same way. So like only recently has it switched over to completely English because originally it was in Hindi and they were taught English as like a second language class or actually a third language class. Yeah. So. Well, I find one of the striking things when I travel is, is the attitude about language. And what I find is, is that the U.S. is pretty uniquely uh, narrow-minded with respect to language. We live in the sea of this joint, we're a big country, I mean, you know. We have a lot of people, we're the third largest nation in the world, 320 million people. And there's all these English speakers around us. And so people just don't feel the need, right? I can find my way to the bathroom, fine, thank you very much. Okay, but when you talk to people from around the world, they don't have that attitude at all. I mean, they're picking up an, a, another language, at least one. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's un, this is unusual here. And then sometimes this creates problems where we're perceived as arrogant. Um, and that is, you go to the other country and you expect the other people in the other country to speak to you in English. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, yeah, that's a bit, bit of an issue. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so, a little bit of history. There's something called the Jom Team Conference, um, and then the CAR framework, um, and the concept of education for all. And it was pushed then um, later by the Millennium Development Goals. And you remember the one that was to uh, education at the primary level, level basically for all. If you remember the data, 91% of boys get a primary education, 90% of girls, so we've achieved essentially parity in the world on primary education, okay? Um, so a lot of this has happened, but I think it's, inter it's instructive to actually read the wording, because it's not too long, of the exact goals from the Education for All framework out of the Dakar, it was called the Dakar framework. That's, Dakar is just the location. Or was. So now, goal number one is expanding and improving comprehensive early childhood care and education for the most disadvantaged and vulnerable children. Okay, so that's connected to the primary education issue in the Millennium Development Goal. Two, all children, particularly girls, children in difficult circumstances, those belonging to ethnic minorities, have access to free, quality, and compulsory primary education by 2015. Well, we're almost, we're almost there. That's pretty cool, okay? Next, ensuring that the learning needs of all young people and adults are met through equitable access to appropriate learning and life skills programs, okay, and the, some Brett or whoever was, or whatever was in charge of uh, writing this, so we end up with two M's and an E in program. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, goal four, achieving 50% improvement in levels of adult literacy by 2015, especially for women, equitable access to basic continuing education. Eliminating gender disparities in primary and secondary edu education by 2005. Okay, primary was achieved. I, I, I'd have to look up the data. The data is at the World Bank website on secondary education and whether we've achieved equity for boys and girls, okay? I, I don't recall the data. Um, with a focus on ensuring girls full equal access to an achievement in basic education with good quality. Six, improving every aspect of the quality of education and ensuring um, excellence so that um, recognizing the measurable learning outcomes are achieved by all, especially the literacy and numeracy and essential life skills. Numeracy, we'll, we'll come back to that issue in a little bit because this is an engineering class. Um, so, emphasis in international education in my reading, I came across some interesting quotes. So I got, I got a kick out of this one. When you educate a man, you educate an individual. When you educate a woman, you educate a family. And so what people say, focus on, if you want to have a greater impact, focus on women and girls, okay? And uh, this was, in the reading, it was kind of interesting. It's like, it's like, you know, this is, there's this old saying that everybody always says, this. I'm like, oh, really? I'd never heard that before. Um, and then there's, a, there's a, also a focus recently on, uh, in connected with the sustainable development goals. And they're coming out this year by, I think they're coming out by September uh, of this year by the UN after the, they have a convene of full meeting of the world body. Um, 
They're also connected to that is they're going to start trying to teach children about sustainable development. Um, they're going to try to teach them about the environment, its important role um, in development. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's pretty fascinating that they have these these kind of broad initiatives. Um, now, <clears throat> with respect to education statistics, um, we're going to pop over and look at it a second. Um, there's a lot of information. I'm going to just look at the World Bank, but you can go to UNICEF and UNESCO um, also, and they have really good information. But this EdStats um, data visualizer is cool. You know how these things go. Um, you've looked at these already. Um, but right here, EdStats. Um, no, hold on a second. I'm sorry, what, what am I missing? You're looking for the data visualizer? Yeah, on EdStats. Yeah. Where is it? I'm missing it. Oh, yes. Thank you. So you know, you know all about this guy. Um, and uh, education statistics here. So, you know, you know how this goes. It plays a movie, dots move around their countries. Um, by clicking here, this is the dropout rate. Um, and then on, this is just the first screen, of course. Uh, net enrollment primary, and you can plot it in linear or log, and uh, study all this. You can check boxes and look at particular countries. And uh, of course, you see up there, you get to pick your x-axis and your y-axis. You know, this is really cool. So you can study education like mad here. It's, it's really um, nicely done. I'm just kind of highlighting this and I'll let you study it if you'd like. Some of you STEM education people on your project could uh, get good information here or already have gotten good information here. Um, there's also, I think, a really an interesting, more recent initiative um, by the UN, this, this Global Education First initiative. Um, this program, uh, I think one of the most, for me on the website, one of the most interesting things is, is under, the, the website doesn't load right all the time. I don't know why, it's something wrong with our website. But their priorities are interesting. If you wanna find out like a modern view on uh, what we ought to be doing in education internationally, this is really nice, this priorities. So they, they classify just in three categories. Put every child in school, give them a quality education, and teach global citizenship. Well, that last part is social justice, okay? That's human rights. That's what they're talking about, a lot of it. And uh, so I would, I, I mean like, okay, so let's just say we look at um, quality of learning. So um, priority two, improve the quality of learning. And then um, <clears throat> they identify barriers here. So you see some of the barriers to quality learning is shortest, shortage of qualified teachers. Of course, there's an issue with STEM there, right? Uh, lack of learning materials, weak foundation for early learning, challenging family environment. Sounds like Columbus, Ohio, right? Um, mismatch of skills in today's livelihoods, language barriers, hunger and poor nutrition, effective systems to evaluate the performance of students. So yeah, under each of these priorities, um, they have this, this sub list. You can see, see costs, shortage of classrooms, child labor, just gender discrimination, um, and under um, global citizenship, um, it's interesting. So, um, barriers is legacy of the current educational system. In other words, how do you change the educational system to get it to focus on global citizenship? Outmoded curricula and learning materials. See, in, in some of these native tongues like Kachikel, one of the fundamental problems is, is do you have a whole curriculum set up in their language along with all the support materials books, etc., in Kachikau, right? So, so this becomes a real, real challenge. Um, lack of teacher capacity is, of course, an issue. In some ways, it's a very crucial issue. Um, inadequate focus on values, lack of leadership. Okay, so I think you get the idea. But th this uh, Global Education First initiative um, seems to be really quite nice. I would also point out under this initiative that resources button right over here at the top has got a great set of resources. Somebody really put some thought into it and didn't just give you the whole laundry list, they picked good ones.
So I've been clicking through there, and everything I find is like, wow, this is good. This is really good. So it's, it, this is really a nice site. Um, okay, next. Um, I, I, I had to pull out some data, okay? I mean, for, for us, as engineers, I pulled out some STEM stuff. So World Bank, UNESCO. Here's science enrollment, tertiary, so that means um, you can think of it as university, okay? Well, it might be a tech school, but think of it normally as university. Total enrollment, so now, the, unfortunately these numbers aren't percentages, they're total enrollment, okay? So this is, um, <clears throat> red over here is 122,000, blah, blah, blah. The, down here is 7,000. So, so India comes out looking really good, just like the United States, because the numbers got 1.3 billion people in India, and we have 320 million people in the United States. So we might both have roughly the same number of people in university education. But this is not a good situation for India, okay? And you can say the same thing about Brazil. So I don't like the way they did this data, but I still thought it was interesting. Um, you can also see some, uh, um, you gotta be careful with how you interpret this data. Usually on these plots, and UN, World Bank, etc. Gray means we don't have data. Okay, so you can't misinterpret. But um, you know, you see the yellow and orange spots is, is quite a bit less in terms of enrollment in science. Here's engineering. Okay, so in engineering, uh, the number max number is about the same, and the pattern is not much different than the last plot. Okay, I mean, you know, it's and, and if you look at where it's happening in engineering. Well, you got Colombia up there, you got Brazil, Latin America, and Mexico, of course, the US, not Europe, okay, India, so on. Um, and uh, it's not that surprising, really. Okay, so the next one, well, no. Um, <clears throat> What was interesting, I went then and found the women, tertiary enrollment, this is the World Bank, tertiary enrollment, and I, I was going to include the plot. I thought, cool, we can compare the total to the, to the women, okay? But it wasn't interesting. Why? Because the color pattern was virtually identical to this, but the numbers are lower, okay? So it's really not informative. Um, Okay, next. I want to get two concepts down um, for thinking about international education. And you're going to be able to think of these concepts in terms of your own education. But education experts think of uh, the historical trends, the broad trends of what's happened in the world on education in, as being one of two things, okay? The first is the utilitarian perspective. And that is that education is a financial investment with returns of economic growth. It fosters political stability, gives students skills to make them productive citizens, supports a stable socioeconomic order, a free market, and capitalism, okay? So engineers are often aligned with this perspective, right? Because why do you go into engineering? You wanna get a good job and make money and live a decent life, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's, and it's very pragmatic, very, Okay, now, uh, there's another perspective, and that's the so-called <coughs> transformational perspective. So this says basically that the political and economic framework or structure favors the wealthy and the powerful, hurts the poor with discrimination and oppression. Um, so education is viewed as a way to improve an understanding of social injustices, to empower disadvantaged populations. Sounds like you're trying to start a revolution, doesn't it? Yeah. In other words, fight for your rights. You're oppressed, fight for your rights. You know, your, your human rights are being violated. You ought to understand that your human rights are being violated and fight, okay? And you know, teach children at an early age about these injustices so when they grow up, they do something about it. I mean, that's what we're talking about here in a transformational perspective. Now, if you think about it for a minute, at first, this sounds radical down here, okay, really radical. But I want to challenge you. I mean, have you had this happening in your education in the United States for you U.S. people? Elements of it. What 
What do you think? It's hard because when you've lived in something, it's hard to step back and take a perspective of, yeah, I, I, uh, that is there. I mean, it's sort of easier to understand this one, in a sense, right? Why? Because of our cultural environment in the United States. A lot of stuff's focused on that. How many engineers say they, they meet a poetry major and they say, well, how are you going to get a job? You know, you know the old statements that are made, right? But my claim is, is that at least I've had, I don't know what you've had, I've had some of this down here. And, and let me, it, it's so, I, I had to think about this a while because this one challenged me. Uh, for me, I think what it's about is, that we don't realize is we have, I'm going to bring it up a little later, education for democracy is a very different thing. So we are taught as children in the United States to, when we hear things, to question it, you know? And we have little voting things in class at times, and you know, we're, we're, we're encouraged to um, be creative and think outside the box. That's different. That is different compared to other parts of the world. So we are, we are trained to be sort of freewheeling. Uh, I had Americans tell me um, in a class like this once that one of the proudest things that they're most proud about being American. I asked a class two years ago this. And it's a full class, Chinese, Indian, Turkish, Filipino, all, all over. And the Amer I said, Americans, what's the proudest thing you are about being an American? And they say, we don't respect authority. The Chinese way. You should see the Chinese side. Holy cow! And you're proud of that? But there is some pride in that in America, right? I don't know. We can beat up on Obama. That's what he's there for. We can beat up on George Bush. We can complain about the president of the university, Gordon Gee, or Drake. You can, you can beat up on me. We can all do it, right? And, and I think we're kind of happy that we can do that. That's part of freedom, right? So we are taught different in this culture, quite a bit different than in other cultures. There's a lot of things that are really unacceptable in other cultures in, in terms of, you know, related to education. You would just, and I, I think it would be hard to move to this country and put your children in the educational system and have them come home and disrespect you, consider disrespect. My kids come home and challenge me all the time. I'm like, oh, jeez, you know. So, so I think there, we, we, we expect people to stand up for themselves. We expect them to be independent, right? We expect an independence. Rugged individualism, it's called in the United States. We, we expect that. Okay, so that's connected to this down here, actually. Okay? So um, we get all kinds of stuff through our education. And not to mention, if you went to a faith-based school, okay, you're, of course, down here on a number of issues. Okay, any comments? So, try to remember these two ideas because we're going to come back to these later on. Because I'm going to challenge you later on and say, how can you create a STEM experiment that will not only edu educating for the top one in STEM with children is easy. I think educating for this one is hard. It's more interesting. Okay, in other words, using STEM to teach human rights or to teach social justice. We'll come back to that um, later. Let's do examples um, quickly. Uh, I mentioned some of these already. So utilitarian examples of education are job training programs, vocational technical education, training for local industry, agriculture, tourism, forestry. Transformation examples are a number of aspects of education for all. Do you notice that the transformational category, if you go back and review it and look at the education for all goals, it was a lot about inclusion of girls and women it's in minorities, et cetera. That's transformational too, okay? Um, so your global citizenship under the, the website that we looked at, uh, Education First Initiative, um, and so forth, okay? And of course, you can just draw broad outlines of these two trends, and they, the way that, when I read it, they sort of fight against each other, in a sense. Um, but of course, there's elements in some educational programs, there's sort of elements of both, right? I mean, certainly. Okay, next. Um, the best book I could find on international education is by Clive Harbour, this gentleman, who's a past professor of international education, School of Education at the University of Birmingham in the UK. 
He's worked in a number of African countries, and he wrote this book, Education and International Development. <coughs> um, and uh, so I, I want to start out with a, a, a depressing quote um, that he raises right in the beginning of his book. He says education can strongly impact people and transform society. But he says, look, go to the UN Human Development Report, 2010, and he quotes it. He says, the, the, the report says, against any automatic, he cautions against any, against any automatic assumption that education directly or necessarily leads to benefits for individuals and society in any straightforward manner. Read economics. Well, you can get all the education in the world, but if you can't get a job, What's education done for you? Well, it's helped your human mind, it's done human development, but it hasn't necessarily raised your standard of living, right? If you, get a, if you can't get a job, what is an education, you know, how useful is it, some people would say. Um, so, per access to um, primary education, he spends a lot of time talking about this access problem and issues of poor attendance, dropout, Low rates of transition to secondary ed. And he identifies a whole list of reasons I'm going to go over. And I find it pretty telling. It tells, it, 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 it's very informative to help you understand why there's education problems in the developing world. So first one, poverty. So a lack of ability to pay fees, buy uniforms, and supplies. My understanding is, is that most plate locations require a uniform, period. I mean, if you have a uniform, you can't come to school. Okay, um, and that, that's secular or religious. That's that's not just okay. Um, pay travel costs because schools aren't close. Um, they lose a helper at home and in the field, so they're losing income by putting the kid in school in the first place. And the students might have other responsibilities at home or lack sufficient light. Read the importance of electricity or solar lanterns in order to read at night and do homework. Next, health, hunger, malnutrition, and disabilities. So poor health, we already talked about this issue. It affects attendance a lot. Um, you remember the data out of the Cabrera film, okay? Um, you need to take care of an ill parent or grandparent. Well, why would that be? Why would a kid need to take care of an ill parent? Well, they don't have other health care, right? Um, why a grandparent? Well, they don't have a nursing home. I mean, you know, this is the way it works. Hunger and poor nutrition affects attendance. Concentration. This happens in the United States. I mean, we have all, we have a ton of food programs in the United States that feed kids so that they can think in school. They're not hungry. Um, so meal programs help improve attendance. Um, internationally, uh, children with disabilities may not be accommodated, and stigma may keep them away from school. I mean, in the United States, everybody you know you're required to go to school um, for primary or you know part of secondary school typically, depending on the state. Um, and even with disability, and they're accommodated with respect to elevators and ramps, all that. I mean, Americans with Disabilities Act covers all that stuff in schools too, of course. So, uh, and then there's also, a lot of schools provide services for children with learning disabilities um, and uh, um, behavioral problems, uh, autism, or you know, there's a whole attention deficit disorder. You know, there's a whole list of things that are accommodate for in a, in a wealthier country that aren't accommodated for in, in, a, in a developing world. Okay. Um, Next, harsh treatment at schools. Children may not want to attend and get their parent support for them if they're treat, treated bad. So the problem is corporal punishment. Um, <laughs> So this is, a, this is a tough one, it's not funny at all. I'm laughing because I'm laughing at myself. And I get my butt whacked in school, in like grade, like grade school. I don't know, I deserve it, but. <laughs> that stuff is not going on today, from what I understand, not. Did anybody have that problem in school? No. Well, in the United States, it's not going, that was all cut out years ago, okay? Um, and uh, it's not worldwide, though. So there's a lot, there can be corporal punishment. Um, unfortunately, Harvard discusses um, a lot nastier stuff than that. Um, discusses uh, the mm, sexual harassment of girls by both male students and boys and male teachers. 
pretty unpleasant part of the book. Um, but I don't know how widespread that is. Um, but it's pretty, it, like I said, it's depressing. Problems with girls attending school are, um, is, is attitudes about girls going to school. Like it's a waste of time and money. Um, oh, and this issue of lack of separate toilet facilities is, is a pretty important issue. Um, look, uh, when I've been in an international school before in South America, the, the toilet scene is not cool, okay? It's tough, um, such as there's no toilet paper. Um, and so, um, and then there's, there is this in other schools, not this one I was in, but um, the issue of, of boys and girls having separate facilities, okay, especially as the girl ages, um, menstruation comes on, the privacy issue is important, and, and you know, this can keep a, a girl away from, um, away from school also. Um, of course, early marriage affects, adversely affects school attendance, of course. Pregnancy is, would often result in a girl dropping out. Um, I think some of that dropping out is happening in the United States still, but there's plenty of girls that go to high school, right, that, that are pregnant. I mean, they, well, honey, I mean, there's, there's gr gr more than in my day. My day it meant a girl dropped out. But today, girls go to school, um, stay in high school, pregnant, um, for instance. Uh, and of course, lack of childcare is a problem with that. So level of education, what's interesting is there's been plenty of studies that have shown that the level of education of a mother is linked to the health and survival of her children, which is amazing. There's amazing statistics on this, okay? Um, so what it means is if you can educate girls, you're going to raise um, the health of her children ultimately, and the survival of her children ultimately. So you sort of come back to that earlier quote, and you start to see, yeah, it kind of does matter that you educate girls, OK? Um, and it, it, everybody knows that if you raise education, you decrease fertility. That's one of the reasons that one of the additional reasons why fertility has dropped worldwide. Um, you know, it's start, we're kind of coming slow in the rate of growth right now, right? I mean, experts are predicting um, over around 9 billion people in the world who are going to level off at. Um, but I don't know if that's dicey predicting the future. Um, irrelevance in the quality of teaching your curriculum. So the curriculum can be irrelevant to local needs. Sometimes this is due to um, colonial <coughs> influence. You teach a high level curriculum that has nothing to do with local, the local situation. Um, some people won't see education as a route out of poverty. There's no local jobs anyway, okay? And if they see the, ch the existing, they see a bunch of high school age kids. They got their education. They don't have any jobs. They're in bad shape. Well, why should I put my kid through this system? It's just a waste of my money. And so people don't do it. So the, the, the teaching in the curriculum can be of very low quality. Um, what's set as a standard for the qualifications of teacher is pretty shocking sometimes, okay? And uh, so parents look at it and say, teaching stinks, quality of education stinks, doesn't matter any anybody I don't get a job, forget it, okay? The location and the quality. If the school is too far away, of course, the attendance goes down. And then there's groups of people like nomads and pastoralists and street children that certainly have difficulty attending school. Don't think those are minor issues. And uh, you travel to the developing world, you, st you see the street children, for instance. Um, classrooms can be low quality. We saw some of that in the film today, uh, lack of heating or cooling. Um, sometimes that doesn't matter, and sometimes it does. Um, it depends. Lack of sufficient light can be too noisy. That seems like, who cares? Oh, man, the school I was in last summer in, in Colombia, I mean, you wouldn't believe how loud it was. The children, the whole thing, somehow it was like a resonance, and the whole thing was just, it was, it was I think, really hard for the kids to work because of the, the noise. And then if you're in a school that has one of these uh, corrugated steel roofs, right? Holy cow, it rains. It's like, wah. You know, it, it's terrible. And then electricity problems, of course, science equipment, um, and the teacher ability, to, we're going to come back to these issues, the teacher's ability to use it. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, there's corruption problems. 
Uh, and at the government level, um, some governments lack sufficient funds to provide free education for everyone, of course. Uh, they don't have adequate buildings, textbooks, teaching materials, and toilets, especially in rural areas. Sometimes they, they provide split shift programs. So the school I was in had a split shift program. So the way it worked is uh, there's two, two sessions a day. Um, one group of children come in from 6 till noon. Another group comes noon till 6. Okay. And uh, they have largely different sets of teachers. Um, uh, it's fully enrolled in both cases. Um, they're getting they're getting six hours of education each, but well, you got to take breaks and got to do lunch and so forth. Um, but what they're achieving is is they're they're fully utilizing that building, okay, which is really important. This was in South Bogota. Um, of course, armed conflict causes a lot of problems and if adversely affecting school attendance and um, emergencies like natural disasters. But they say that a lot of times if you can get the school going again, it creates normalcy for the families and children. It, it helps the community um, recover. Okay, quality, educational quality and outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so one perspective on assessing quality is the human capital perspective. That is, you, you give an education and you count how many jobs you get. Well, this is what OSU does, right? You know you're all counted. Did you all get a job when you graduated? And then they brag about this, okay? Go to Engineering and Career Services and download the database from last year. About Then it gives the, the salary levels per major, et cetera. Um, then there's the human rights perspective. So did it promote inclusion? And there's how many, how many women did we get involved? How many minorities did you get involved? And we assess ourselves. If you go to the College of Engineering Strategic Plan, look at it, they assess themselves, one of their aspects is, is women and minorities in, enrolled in engineering. Okay, so we're failing. We have 20% women in College of Engineering. I mean, that's, that, that in my view is a failure. We could do much better than that, okay? And you know that what will happen if we can enroll a 50%, let's say. What do you think will happen, let's say, let, what will happen if, I, if we enrolled in this College of Engineering um, 50% women, and we start, got that going, and, and you studied in four years, and I took the average grade point now, I took the average grade in four years, and I have 50-50. What do you think will happen to the grade point? Up or down? Uh, up. Uh, yes, absolutely up. Girls, um, women, score higher on these core subjects of science, for instance, than boys do. They actually do. The grade points are higher coming in than, than the men, okay? So, so from a certain perspective, you forget about it. Who cares if it's men and women? We just want a bunch of smart people, right? So it makes sense in that way, too. Next, social justice perspective. Did it, did it help with the struggle against injustices in your country? You know, remember, a lot, we're talking about a lot of countries here with dictators, okay? I mean, it's not like here. I mean, it's, it's very different. There's a lot of statistics on outcomes on the web, and I would encourage you to look at um, the World Bank again, or, or UNESCO, for instance, or UNICEF. Um, so he starts a discussion then on this, is, this issue of, are inequalities in society actually reinforced by the educational system in, in a society? Is there a meritocracy? We love in the university to pride ourselves on being a meritocracy. But are we? We might be a meritocracy within the university. Once you're in the university, okay. But we're like a little closed bubble. Think, of, think more broadly about Ohio. Are we what, what uh, he calls a socioeconomic reproduction system? Okay. So what happens in this is uh, the rich, you know, they've looked at studies in the United States of the how much are rich, the rich people spend on their kids' education? You know, they get that, the computer, the, the, any educational tutorial materials. They get them the SET prep stuff. They get them the, it goes on and on, right? And, and, and then you compare the amount of money that's spent by the rich to the poor. In, in this country, it's been growing. The distance between this is growing a lot. There's a very big difference on those two points. So what it means is, is the rich send their kids to good schools, better schools. We all know that. That's happening, right? 
It really is. And poor can't do that. So what he says is he calls it a socioeconomic reproduction system. In other words, education isn't doing anything to, to reduce these inequalities, social inequalities. It's, in fact, reinforcing them. It's sort of depressing, in a sense. But you know, when I talk to people in the developing world, you hear, it's similar to here in that sense. In the, in the developing world, they're typically sending their kids, the rich are sending their kids to a private school, okay? For instance, now all the advantages, okay? You can send them to the U.S. for advanced education, whatever. So it, it, there's really quite a stark difference between these two things. So it's, it's really important. Try to, get the, get, try to get Ohio State to really pay attention to this issue. Good luck. We used to. 25 years ago when I arrived, we were bringing people from socioeconomic backgrounds that were, you know, further down. But we somehow it was decided to take OSU up make it hard to get into OSU. At the same time, financial aid is not being, um, as a percentage, not being directed towards helping smart poor kids. It's not happening at this place, it's not. Um, I mean, if students want to protest against something, do it, protest. Go back to the 60s, man, protest. I'll join. Um, TVET. Technical and vocational education. You know, when you read about this about at the international level, it's a lot like here. You remember in high school those kids that went down to the shop and the, the what do you call it here? The, there's different names for it. Vocational school. Let's just call it vocational school. So it's, it's very similar. So, you know, you need literacy and numeracy and language and job-specific skills, but in particular job-specific skills. So you might become a tradesperson, a computer technician, a bricklayer, an auto mechanic. And then, you know, it was a fascinating read that the parents' views in the developing world on this is like, eh, it's kind of second best. I'd want to send my kid to the university, okay? So it's, it's kind of interesting, but in a lot of ways, this can be extremely useful in some countries. Next thing, political learning, political indoctrination, socialization. Um, indoctrination, I'm meaning every sense of the word of indoctrination, okay? This happens all the time. Um, education for democracy, we already discussed a little bit. And then there's a lot of emphasis in some countries on globalization, trying to educate the masses to be economically competitive, okay? So the country can um, compete. Um, quickly, numeracy, mathematics, science, and technology. This is a really cool report out of UNESCO and the Brookings Institution. Basically is what every sh child should know about those subjects, okay? Which is basically STEM without the E, kind of. It's STEM though, basically. So the rationale for learning numeracy and mathematics is economic development, calculations, uh, and it will move into the STEM areas in business and government and enable um, success in a complex technological society. Um, at the early childhood level, STEM people, um, groups, pay attention here. So that's defined as zero to eight years old. Numeracy and mathematical education is things like number sense and operations, stuff like this on the right. Um, spatial sense and geometry, like you know boxes, triangles, rectangles, rhombus, you know, all that stuff, trapezoids. Patterns and classification. Measurement and comparisons, rulers, protractors, compasses, things like that. Primary levels, five to 15 years old, and then you're worrying about things, learning about number concepts and operations, more on geometry, um, how to use mathematics um, in simple problems. At the 10 to 19, you think of this as a little over, this is like middle school uh, slash high school. Then you do, you do the more fun stuff, uh, numbers, algebra, and geometry, um, applications to uh, like personal finance and being an informed consumer and data and statistics, um, you know, mean, median, mode, you know, things like that, standard deviation probably. Um, with respect to science and technology, it's known to be important for economic development, but just emerging for children. So I researched this on the web and try to find information about STEM education for children. And it, it's, it, I find things saying like, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. But I'm not finding too many big programs. The best stuff I could find is in the book, but um, we'll be talking more about that more near the end of class. 
But the question is, is, is it really possible? Are the schools equipped for it? Are the teachers ready for it? Are homes ready for it? But what Clive Harper says is many of the challenges that the world faces in health, environment, energy, will require thinking and solutions that are informed by knowledge of science and engineering. I was pretty amazed by that. So he, he's really foreseeing this stuff happen in the lower levels, the K through 12, let's say. Um, what, he, what he says, uh, or in this area of um, childhood learning, inquiry skills, awareness of the natural and physical world, tech awareness. So at the primary level, life sciences, physical science, earth science, um, awareness of, and use of digital technology like computers, communications. Um, at the, the secondary level, essentially what we call secondary level, biology, chemistry, physics. This sounds like high school, right? Earth science, scientific approaches, environmental awareness and digital learning, so yes, computers. Um, it's really important. Uh, so what are the lessons for the engineer? Um, number one, we need digital learning equipment, low cost and rugged, we're gonna come to that later on. We need scientific equipment, STEM projects and experiments. We need engineers in schools. We need technically competent educa educators. Can we do STEM education for the educators? Yep. Next Monday, I'll let, we, have a, we have a group of 11 students from Columbia doing just that, working with teachers in the Bowtie area to um, educate them how to do STEM education for children. And they actually know a lot already. I'm um, working with a, a number of um, expert groups. One of them is uh, Pequeños Scientificos, which is little scientists. So later on, we're going to get to this humanitarian um, STEM education. That's it. Sorry I went over. 